All right. Um, so um, my name is Natalie Kirby. I'm a doctoral student at the University of Birmingham in the UK. Um, and the presentation I'm going to show you today uh, is about considerations for including female research participants in exercise and sports science research. Uh, so firstly, going to just talk about why you would um, bother including, including females, including women, or why study sex differences, hormones, and the menstrual cycle. Um, firstly, you'll never be short of research questions. So despite the best efforts of some um, great researchers who have devoted their entire careers to just researching women and just looking at um, sex differences in sport and exercise science research, there is still a gap. Um, so there are lots of questions to be answered. And in that, you might actually end up with more results. Um, because if you're trying to answer your hypothesis, but you include um, both sexes, you might not only find your answer, but um, dis discover if there is or isn't a sex difference um, in your specific outcome measures. Um, female participants are generally quite interested in learning more about themselves and their bodies through research. So you'll get um, some fantastic uh, participants who will really buy in uh, to these studies, uh, which is which is great to have. Um, anyone who is really keen to be there, is really interested, is going to be um, more likely to be able to rearrange their schedule, really put in the effort during the sessions, and all the things you need from a participant. That buy-in um, and getting that buy-in from your participants is super helpful. Uh, in terms of research funding, this is also going to be an advantage for you. Um, not only saying you will include uh, females or women in your research, but actually being able to know what's feasible and realistic and having the background knowledge that's required for the appropriate controls and study design uh, when you're writing that grant or writing that proposal or scholarship. Uh, one example of this is the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, um, which is a major funding body in Canada, a major government funding body. Um, one of their current pillars is that science is better with sex and gender. I was really looking for uh, people to incorporate both sexes into the research proposals. And you'll probably score some extra points on your grant if you're able to successfully do so. Um, translating your skills and your degree into practice. I understand that WinTech is a very applied um, institution. And so some of you might be working with practitioners already or aim to be um, a practitioner after your degree. And so knowing how to individualize programs and um, services, which include nutrition, strength conditioning, and, and rehab services, um, again, are gonna be really helpful for buy-in. And two things that help with buy-in, one is uh, if your client feels like your program has been individualized, no one wants a blanket program. Um, and second, if you're getting them better results because of the knowledge that you have um, is also going to really help uh, with your clients kind of faith in you. So one example of this is uh, in a recent qualitative study um, that just came out last week. Uh, the authors surveyed uh, professional rugby players and they found that two thirds of the athletes that they surveyed self medicated to alleviate symptoms of menstruation during their cycle. Um, so if you don't know that your, your client or your athlete is um, self-medicating, if you don't know anything about their cycle, but you're trying to really push strength and really push um, a heavy, heavy week in terms of resistance training, but they're taking NSAIDs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, um, they might be dampening the, the adaptive responses that you're aiming for in that week of heavy resistance training. Um, so if you know more about that, then you're able to shuffle things around or talk to your athlete or participant about uh, possible alternative uh, forms of managing uh, some of the side effects of uh, their cycle of menstruation. But you won't know unless you're able to talk about that with them. Um, and this, isn't, this is something that's, that's quite common. Um, a separate study reported that over half of the young women that they surveyed uh, reported that their menstrual cycle does impact upon their training and their performance. Um, another point is that more females are in performance and physically demanding settings than really ever before. Um, firstly, this includes the military and occupational roles such as firefighters, um, police officers, and paramedics. 
and they are looking to, to meet physical performance standards for their job. They're looking to have the physical attributes to keep themselves safe when they're doing their job. Um, and they also might be looking at coming back to work after an injury or um, a setback. So there is that demand for, um, for female athletes to, to have this information, or sorry, f female occupational personnel. Um, besides that, you have the other side of it where there are more female athletes at the highest level and increased high level participation. Um, so at the very, high, very highest level, we have the Olympic Games. In Sydney in 2000, only 38% of the athletes in the Olympic Village were females. Um, fast forward to Rio, and you had 45% of athletes um, who were female. Uh, Tokyo, whenever it does happen, is expected to have the most gender parity of any Olympics uh, yet. Um, coming down a little bit, but still at kind of the elite level, um, and these are women who will be looking for uh, this kind of advice and this kind of information. Uh, female participants in the Boston Marathon have gone up 21% in the last 10 years, um, which is quite a bit, a lot more women looking for this information. Uh, and to mention the Boston Marathon, uh, this photo on the left is of Catherine Switzer, who was the first woman um, to run the Boston Marathon with a bib number. She did so by registering with her um, initials instead of her first name. And she did that in 1967. And this photo is of the race organizer trying to rip um, the bib numbers off of her while she's running. Um, and it wasn't until 1972 when uh, women were actually legally allowed to run uh, the Boston Marathon and marathons in general. Um, so that's why you really see this lag um, and this gap. And that's what's contributed to the, the lack of research, which include uh, females and female athletes. Because we've, in a, uh, is, as recent as 2014, um, it was found that females only made up 39%, about a third of participants in sport and exercise science um, or sport and exercise medicine research in four major journals. Um, during this presentation, I'm going to use a few different uh, terms that you might not be so familiar with or might need reminding of. And so a couple of these terms, uh, the first couple I'm going to talk to you about is gender versus sex. So I'm going to mention sex differences quite a bit. Uh, and when I say sex differences, I'm referring to biological sex, um, whereas gender would be referring to more of the um, societal uh, societal uh, terms and societal ideas of gender. So we're going to talk about sex differences today, mostly. Um, I'm also going to be referring to estrogen and progesterone. And these are the two ovarian hormones which um, vary during a woman's menstrual cycle or normally menstruating women's cycle. Um, and they'll vary during the follicular phase, the luteal phase, and during ovulation. So these terms seem a little bit like, ooh, you're not really sure, you need some reminding. Um, don't be embarrassed to be asking more questions um, because you're probably not the only one. Uh, in another recent study, 16% of the female athletes that uh, the authors surveyed were able to correctly identify the ovarian hormones that vary during a menstrual cycle, which is estrogen and progesterone. So, like I said, don't be embarrassed. Um, ask more questions. There's probably other people who want to know this or have this information as well. So, speaking of the follicular and the luteal phase, this is what a typical menstrual cycle looks like. And I say a typical 28 day, um, starting with the follicular phase and uh, menstruation in the first few days to initiate the cycle. Uh, during the follicular phase, you'll see that estrogen, which is in the orange line, um, stays uh, quite low at the beginning until rising to its peak just before ovulation. Um, progesterone stays quite level uh, before rising in the luteal phase only. Estrogen also rises in the luteal phase, but not quite to the same extent. Uh, on this um, figure, I also have the two anterior pituitary hormones um, that influence the menstrual cycle, and that's luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. Those will both peak um, about around ovulation. Um, and have some influence, but today we're mostly going to talk about progesterone and estrogen. So before skipping to the next slide, um, I'm just going to have you take a look specifically at estrogen, specifically at that orange line and what it does um, or it, 
what it's meant to do during a typical menstrual cycle. So this is also a figure which shows estrogen during a menstrual cycle. And that's the average in the blue line. Um, this was taken from blood samples from um, a group of women every single day for, for a repeated number of cycles um, to get these, these values and these prediction intervals. So the first one I'll have you look at is the yellow shading. Um, and that is the interwoman variability. So within all of these women that they were uh, sampling in their study, they found that this is how much estrogen levels were varying uh, between two, two or three or um, however many different women. And still the, um, that uh, light green shading, that's the intercycle variability. So in the same woman from month to month or cycle to cycle, they were still getting a large amount of variability in the level of hormones um, that were uh, in their body, in their blood. I'll also have you look at the um, yellow circle at the top and that circling ovulation. And the red line down the middle is the average, um, but in that light kind of peachy color, again, you have the interwoman variability with that pinky color just on the inside being the intercycle variability. So if you're trying to catch ovulation, um, as you can see, that also varies quite a bit, um, as well as the actual length of a cycle, which is the shading in blue. Um, some other terms that we're going to talk about are the oral contraceptive pill, um, sometimes abbreviated to OCP. Uh, these, these pill packages uh, are made up of 28 pills. The first 21 pills in a package are what we call active pills, whereas the other uh, seven the last week are inactive pills. Now these active pills uh, contain hormones and they can either be a combined pill, which means that can, they contain both estrogen and progesterone, or they can be a progestin-only mini pill. And the hormones contained in there are synthetic estrogens and um, progestin. Uh, oral contraceptive pills can also be monophasic or triphasic, and monophasic means that there is the same concentration of uh, hormones in all of the active pills, all three weeks worth, whereas triphasic pills um, increase in concentration uh, as the weeks go on until uh, they reach the, the inactive placebo sugar pills for the last week. There are, um, besides the oral contraceptive pill, there are different types of hormonal contraceptives, um, which contain, usually contain progestin only, and progestin is the synthetic um, progesterone. And this is, uh, this is, this shows the prevalence of use, kind of the makeup of um, how many elite athletes and what proportion of elite athletes are using uh, or, or not using hormonal contraceptives and what type. Um, so you can see on the, on the left in the gray, uh, about half of them were not using any type of hormonal contraceptive, whereas the other half were. Um, oral contraceptives in uh, red was the most popular, um, combined pills having both estrogen, synthetic estrogen and progestins were uh, also the most popular. Um, but other, other athletes were using an implant, which is a, a small red metal rod that is inserted in the upper arm, and it releases a steady, um, continuous amount of progestin. That's good for about three years. Um, there's also an injection, which is a one-time shot every three months, um, where someone will go to their doctor to get a progestin injection into their arm. Um, about 2% of the women surveyed also used um, an IUD. This is an intrauterine device or an IUS called an intrauterine system. Um, a popular form of this is the coil and these are multi-year contraceptive pills that are, con or, sorry, contraceptives that are uh, contained in the uterus and again, release that kind of steady continuous amount of, of hormones. Um, when we're talking about synthetic estrogens and progesterones um, versus the, the hormones that someone produces um, within themselves, we're talking about exogenous versus endogenous. So exogenous being the hormones that you would take in, endogenous being the hormones um, you would produce yourself. So this figure shows um, the exogenous and endogenous levels of uh, estrogen when taking a monophasic combined pill. So in, this, in the solid line, that is exogenous levels of estrogen, and that really peaks as soon as they take their, their pill once a day, 
and comes down steadily throughout the day before the next day, hopefully at the same time when they're taking their pill again. During that time, um, endogenous estrogen is suppressed and that's suppressed to about the level that um, women will, will experience during the early follicular phase when hormones are low. Um, in the last seven days, when they're taking their, um, their placebo pill or inactive pill, this is quite a transient withdrawal phase um, where the exogenous levels of hormones drop off and endogenous starts to rise. Um, how this transient phase looks can really depend on the uh, type of pill um, because there are different brands and different types of progestins as we'll see in a second and those can all have different half-lives and that means that the um, time it takes them to uh, kind of disintegrate and be filtered out of the body is different. So that transient phase can look different from woman to woman. Uh, this is a really good table that I took out of a uh, review from Stacy Sims and Allison Heather a couple years ago. Uh, I don't want to go through the whole thing, but I just want to draw your attention to a couple things. And these are different types of progestins that can be contained in a combined oral contraceptive pill. And they have different generations and different secondary or side effects. Um, one of them, you'll see number five, um, has really strong anti-estrogen effects. So thinking about what your outcome measures are and how they might be affected by estrogen um, is, is worthwhile if you include women who are using an oral contraceptive pill in your studies. Um, and as well, I want to draw your attention to the very last one, a fourth generation progestin, which suppresses the secretion of vasopressin and aldosterone. And those two hormones are really important for fluid regulation. Uh, now, I do research into environmental physiology and specifically thermoregulation. And that's why fluid regulatory hormones are, are really important for the stuff that I do, um, especially if you're trying to drive an adaptation to heat stress, um, being able to increase someone's plasma volume or um, body fluids is going to depend on their ability to uh, secrete vasopressin and aldosterone. So those changes could really affect um, your study depending on what, what you're looking into. Now on top of um, the type of progestin, there are also different type, different uh, sorry, concentrations of progestins can contain in these pills, and that can range from 50 to 500 micrograms um, per pill. So the gold standard would be to um, group or to use one type of, of pill or one type of uh, progestin. So you can, you, you can use that one type or you can possibly group by generation or group by um, what you know about how they affect estrogen and things like that, all depending on what your outcome measures are and how progestins uh, can affect them. So now we know a little bit more about the menstrual cycle and about hormonal contraceptives. Um, so how does that come into play when it comes to exercise performance? Um, so first, there are differences between men and women in terms of uh, exercise performance and, and that effect of sex. So if you're looking to do a study or an intervention that involves resistance training, you can expect relatively similar strength increases um, between men and women, uh, for, for both men and women. But it's worth thinking about how you plan uh, to, to get those strength increases or hypertrophy increases and what you're depending on uh, to, to make those gains. Because a lot of uh, resistance training and studies on resistance training in men have relied on being able to increase testosterone levels. Um, and women only have about 10% of the testosterone levels as men, and it doesn't really uh, vary during the menstrual cycle or vary in response to resistance training. So if your rationale for implementing a certain type of resistance training protocol is that will increase testosterone levels, it might not be the right protocol for your study if you're including both men and women. Um, when you're designing your study, you will probably think about the, the rep ranges that you'll use. Um, and they'll usually be sub-maximal, and you'll take a percentage of their maximum, uh, or their one rep maximum. But there are differences in muscle fatigability between men and women. So um, if you're planning to do, say, someone's work up to a five rep max, well, what you can expect from men is that they might hit about 85% of their one rep max, whereas women might be able to hit about 90% of their one rep max for five reps. Um, this is going to be even more noticeable as you go to lower um, percentages 
of their one rep maximum um, and, and higher rep ranges. So in designing that protocol, thinking about, okay, how many reps do I need to get the most out of this protocol, to get the most out of this intervention? Um, and does that differ between my male and female cohorts? Um, a lot of this muscle fatigability, a lot of these fatigability differences are due to fiber type, where women have a greater proportion of type 1 fibers, where men seem to have a little bit greater proportion of, of type 2 in comparison to women. There are also things to consider during endurance exercise. Um, so one of these things is substrate utilization and RER or respiratory exchange ratio. Um, if you're doing a study where you're looking for someone to exercise at a low intensity, say around ventilatory threshold or lactate threshold 1, um, what you can expect to see in their RER in men and women might be a little bit different. Um, for men, you'll probably expect around 0.85 to 0.87 RER value, whereas women might be, might be slightly lower. Um, and that's because they tend to oxidize fat a little bit more than men. Um, they also will regulate their, their blood flow and uh, delivery of blood uh, to the muscles and around the body a slightly different way. Um, so men have a greater stroke volume and cardiac output, even relative to their size. Um, so that means that women have to increase heart rate slightly more uh, for a given intensity. Um, and the opposite goes for blood pressure, where um, men tend to have a much higher blood pressure during exercise, whereas women's uh, will be a little bit lower than, than men. So knowing what you're expecting in terms of these variables um, can really help you during, during your study. Um, some of you might be interested in, interested in doing um, research into central or peripheral fatigue uh, in terms of the neuromuscular system. If you're trying to drive central fatigue um, in, a, in a protocol, you'll probably get similar uh, responses in men and women, but women uh, tend not to peripherally fatigue at the neuromuscular junction quite as much. Um, and this is really mostly observed in those single joint exercises. So again, this is going to be dependent on your study, but it is um, worth thinking about when you're, when you're implementing your design. Um, going back to kind of endurance, um, full body exercise, women do tend to ventilate a little bit faster um, for, a given, for a given intensity, and that's mostly due to differences in uh, lung size relative to their body size. Um, and lung, lung and airway geometry and how, how they're shaped and how that works. Um, thermoregulation, like I said, is something that I study. It's a little bit closer to my heart. Um, and sex differences here can be exacerbated um, because of the heat. So something that you might want to consider when uh, implementing an exercise in the heat study or protocol um, is the importance of size of your of your athletes or of your participants. Um, as men do tend to be a little bit on the larger side, um, there, are, there are differences in the amount of heat that they'll produce for a given intensity. So this is a really nice study by um, Ravellini and colleagues. Uh, these were all in men, but it's showing the difference that uh, size can have. So at the top, they're matching by percent VO2 max, um, in the middle by a set external workload, a fixed wattage. Um, whereas the last, um, the last panel there where core temperature changes are similar between the small and large group, they're matching by metabolic heat production. So their external workload is normalized by the body weight of the participant. And you can see that, that um, they're able to match the change in core temperature a little bit better. So it doesn't mean you have to match participant sizes, but depending on what you're um, comparing, you might want to think about matching the workload uh, as normalized by size. Um, the, there is also a biophysical uh, aspect of this. So size, the size to surface area, or sorry, the surface area to body mass ratio um, can play a role uh, depending on kind of the, the extent of the heat stress. So a smaller person will have the advantage because they'll have a greater surface area to body mass ratio, um, as long as air temperature is lower than the skin temperature. Whereas as uh, air temperature tends to come, or rises about 35, 40, or, or upwards, um, the advantage will be with a larger person who has a smaller surface, surface area to body mass ratio. Um, there are also sex differences in sweating, which is something we like to study in the thermoregulation as well. Um, and the, these panels on the left show differences between men and women 
for a given, um, their intensity was uh, normalized by, by body weight or by size, um, but they still saw differences at these higher intensities with the women in the uh, darker gray and the males in the white circles. Um, and this is a vis visualization of that from a separate study, um, just showing the amount uh, of, of sweat that is produced uh, at different sites on the body in men versus women. They're exercising uh, between 150 and 160 beats per minute. So their intensity was matched by uh, heart rate. Um, so you can see on this that women are sweating less. Um, and this is really efficient in humid, he humid heat where um, you will very quickly saturate the skin with water and there's no real advantage to sweating more. Um, but in dry heat where men do sweat more, it's really important for evaporative heat loss, a, a heat loss, especially when the air temperature is above skin temperature because that larger body size combined with their um, greater amount of sweating and the greater cardiac output um, will really give men an advantage. So thinking about what um, temperature and what condition you're going to be comparing sex differences in could have an effect on what you're looking for or what you see. Um, I also uh, do a little bit of research into heat acclimation and heat acclimation uh, for those who are a little bit unfamiliar is just the adaption or sorry adaptation to repeated bouts of heat stress. Um, this study from Jessica me and colleagues showed that short-term heat acclimation, which ranges about four to seven days. Um, it, it was shown here and it's been shown in past studies that is quite effective in men. Um, and this is during a running heat tolerance test. You can see after five days, the males in the left panel, um, that those black circles, um, their core temperature has come down quite a bit and there's not really any more advantage to 10 days of heat acclimation. Um, whereas the females on the left, you can see after 30 minutes, there's quite a similar core temperature um, at both baseline and after five days of heat acclimation. Um, and it takes 10 days of heat acclimation for uh, these, these women to improve their thermoregulation during exercise in the heat. Um, similarly, our lab found that uh, four days of heat acclimation wasn't enough to improve performance. So these physiological adaptations are translating um, to performance outcomes. During this time trial, four days wasn't enough to improve performance, but um, it did take nine days for us to reach an average of 8% of uh, increase in, in power output during a time trial. And this was using traditional heat acclimation, which is in a chamber, um, like the one at Wintec, but using, but um, recently some of my work has been looked in, has looked into using post-exercise sauna as a different form of heat acclimation. And we're also seeing some sex differences in kind of the mechanisms of the way they adapt. So giving us some clues as to what's going on and why, why this is happening and why we're seeing these differences. Um, there are also effects of, of the menstrual cycle. So within sex, just looking at women, uh, there are effects of menstrual cycle on exercise. So I'll just remind you, um, in the top corner there is the uh, two phases, two main phases of the menstrual cycle, the follicular phase and the luteal phase, um, and what the hormones are kind of doing in those phases. So in the luteal phase, we see greater fat oxidation, uh, which leads to a lower RER, but this is um, a little bit dependent on intensity. You'll see this more at lower intensities, whereas they, try, they tend to be quite similar at, at higher intensities, and especially in trained um, participants or trained athletes. In terms of uh, muscle strength, it's likely that um, people are stronger during the follicular phase, but um, due to some methodological differences, um, there's been studies kind of finding uh, that there's no difference or that they are stronger in the uh, early follicular or uh, late follicular phase. In terms of uh, the, the reason for this muscle strength or um, protocols that, that utilize that stronger, maybe, follicular phase. Um, this is because estrogen is a anabolic hormone, whereas uh, progesterone, which is elevated during the luteal phase, is uh, likely a catabolic hormone. Um, when this comes to performance in self-paced exercise, um, again, at low intensities, uh, you, where there's that greater fat oxidation, uh, you might see lower RP, um, perceived exertion, sorry, um, and, and RER during the luteal phase, but, in, but at high intensities, um, people might have an advantage in their follicular phase.
but a lot of this in especially again in trained athletes is really going to depend on the individual so some people will experience really bad um symptoms of menstruation um, or premenstrual symptoms and uh, that's happening in the early follicular phase so if they're getting those those things that are putting them off and they're not able to perform at their best then that really isn't going to be uh, of much benefit to them um, but in terms of cohort studies it seems that there's really no big effect on uh, self-paced performance. Um, bringing it back to thermoregulation, uh, there is an increase in ventilation and heart rate uh, during the luteal phase, but again, this is gonna depend on training status. So um, in someone who is trained, who has a lower fat mass, there tends to be less of that fluctuation um, between the hormones um, and, and between cycles. Uh, so, with that lower fluctuation, um, you might not see kind of the same same differences between the phases as you might for a less trained person. Um, when it comes to hormonal contraceptives, these can also have an effect on exercise um, performance. Going back to substrate utilization, um, most of our knowledge comes from combined oral contraceptives, and this is for um, all of these outcomes. Um, and we know that there are different types of contraceptives. There's progestin only or different types that, that aren't pills. Um, but this is where most of our knowledge is coming from, these monophasic um, combined oral contraceptives. So in terms of um, substrate utilization, uh, there, oh, sorry. Um, in terms of substrate utilization, it doesn't really look like there's much difference between um, men or men <laughs> between normally menstruating women and those using oral contraceptives, but we've kind of had had mixed results depending on the oral contraceptive. Uh, same with muscle strength and hypertrophy, depending on the type of progestin that's contained in uh, the oral contraceptive pill. Um, there have been both positive and negative results of using oral contraceptives, so that's kind of still up for debate. Uh, VO2 max might be lower in women using oral contraceptives, but again, when it comes to trained uh, athletes, you, their, their training status is a lot more important than whether they're using hormonal contraceptives or not. Um, however, in some less trained cohorts, um, in terms of adapting to training, uh, specifically in HIT studies, um, there's been some evidence that using hormonal contraceptives might actually dampen their adaptations to these types of uh, protocols. Um, again, in terms of thermoregulation, uh, while hormonal contraceptives um, might still cause some changes, um, again, we've seen positive and negative results, um, this is going to depend a lot on training status. Um, so there's typically kind of a still that persistent increase in resting temperature during a quasi-luteal phase. Um, so it's not the real luteal phase because they're taking oral contraceptives, but um, when they would be in their luteal phase, there still seems to be kind of a rise in, in resting core temperature, just like someone would see uh, normally in their luteal phase. Um, however, when it comes to actual exercise performance, um, there doesn't really seem to be a difference between uh, the, these quasi phases, between um, the, the normal menstrual the normal menstrual cycle phases, um, or between women who are using or not using oral contraceptives. Um, so when it comes to actual self-paced performance in the heat, there doesn't really seem to be a difference. The significant symbols there indicate differences between the environmental conditions. So you have dry on the left and humid on the, on the right, um, not actually the phases. So how can you incorporate all of this new knowledge into designing your study? Um, and this is important whether you're just including females or if you're looking at sex differences specifically. So if you're including both males and females or you want to look at males versus females, um, the gold standard would be to have normally menstruating women and test them in uh, the main, three main hormonal profiles. So that would be early follicular when both hormones are low, um, late follicular or ovulation when there's a peak in estrogen, um, as well as mid luteal where both estrogen and progesterone are elevated. Um, you would want to uh, think about matching your groups or matching your intervention or your um, protocol. So you can match them by fitness. 
Uh, one way to do that would be to look at fat-free mass. And so often the way we represent fitness of our participants is by saying their VO2 max. That's normally um, normalized by body weight, but um, one way to normalize it might be through fat-free mass because that five to 10% difference uh, you usually see between men and women in VO2 max is primarily due to the difference in fat mass in women, or the greater fat mass, sorry, in women. Um, and as we mentioned, looking at uh, what influence the size of your participants might have on how they respond to your exercise intervention or exercise protocol. Um, when you do look into the menstrual cycle phases or test in different menstrual cycle phases, um, if this is your main outcome, you want to verify what phase they're in. And you can do that by um, taking blood samples, testing the levels of estrogen and progesterone when uh, they come in for their visits. Um, now, you will also want to de decide on your phase windows. So if you're saying early follicular, okay, does that mean day one to three? Does it mean day one to five? Does it mean day three to five? Um, and making that decision and deciding, okay, how much of a window am I going to allow? What's important to me? How much can I control? Um, are things that you'll, you'll consider when designing your study. Um, lastly, looking at oral contraceptive use and how that will influence your study design. So if you want to compare um, the, the effect of using oral contraceptives versus um, having a normal menstrual cycle, uh, you might have normally menstruating women uh, compared to users of oral contraceptives. And when you're testing women who are using oral contraceptives, um, it would, pr depending on your question again, but you'll likely want to test them during the active phase. Um, because as we mentioned, that inactive phase, when you're having the withdrawal of the exogenous hormones, um, can be quite transient. So getting that, that timing right might be a little bit more difficult, um, unless you're comparing the effect of that transient window um, versus taking an active pill. Um, but if you're comparing between, uh, between women who are using or not using it, testing oral contraceptive users in the active phase um, is going to be your most kind of controllable time. Uh, we said controlling the brand or the type, or at least thinking about the influence that it could have on, on your study and on your outcome measures is important. Um, the duration that your participants have used, been using oral contraceptives uh, is also a factor. So anything more than six months is, is probably good and is what, rec what is recommended. Um, Lastly, when you're designing this study and you want, to use, you want to include, sorry, people who are using oral contraceptives, a question that is worth asking them is if they ever use PACs continuously. So we talked about those 21 active pills and the seven inactive pills. Um, during that inactive phase, women will experience or usually experience a withdrawal bleed. Um, but if they just take both PACs um, or both uh, sets of active pills, right after uh, one another without going through the week of inactive uh, pills, they can skip that withdrawal bleed. And that might be something that people do if they have a race or a holiday or just something when um, it's not really convenient for them and they have the control over it to, to not be experiencing that withdrawal bleed during that time. Um, so asking your participants if they ever do that, if they're planning to do that, um, and maybe to let you know if they're going to do that because that might influence when you're bringing them in and. Um, what what point in their pill taking that they're at. Um, and this doesn't even mention other the other horm hormonal contraceptives that we talked about, um, which are gaining popularity. Um, the type of study that, that you're running, so I'm referring to uh, the, the design of it. So if you're doing a cross-sectional or acute study, um, if you're looking to test in different um, menstrual cycle phases, uh, you'll want to also random, think about randomizing this order, so not testing everyone for the first time in their follicular phase, um, because we know about learning effects or training effects, or things like that, so um, randomizing that order is important. If you are doing a cross-sectional or acute study where um, you're, looking at, you're looking to include both men and women and you're not really that fussed about what phase they're in, um, for ecological validity, it might just be worth completely randomizing when people come in. So having some people in one phase, other people in another phase, but just knowing what phase they're in or knowing if they're taking contraceptives or having that information um, is useful to see if your um, 
data is kind of weighted one way or the other. Um, and that's sometimes a little bit more feasible and offers that real life ecological validity um, with some outcome measures. So it's worth thinking about, okay, how much is my outcome measure actually going to be influenced by hormonal contraceptives or by the menstrual cycle? And can I just include um, women in various phases and how much disruption or how much noise will that cause? If you're doing a case study, you can follow people th or follow women through their phases and get a little bit more information to show kind of that um, full picture and show what kind of subjective uh, feelings they're having and overlay that with their training and think about, okay, does this all contribute? What's happening um, during this phase? How does my athlete feel? Does that impact what they do? When it comes to an intervention or repeated measures uh, type study, there are a few different approaches to this or possible ways you could do this. Um, this is an example from um, one of my PhD studies where we did a 28 day intervention. So every few days they were using a sauna after exercise and they did that intervention for 28 days and they tested um, pre and post on either end of that intervention and that was separated by kind of your typical menstrual cycle. So you can see that the two uh, women that, that I've chosen to, to show as a representation didn't have a 28 day cycle. So if someone's cycle is 26 days, you're still testing them on, you might still test them on day four and day two. So you have a little bit of, of wiggle room, but their, their hormones should be relatively similar when you're testing them pre and post. Same thing with the, with the next woman, next participant. She came in for trial A at day 23, um, and then she had, a, she had a shorter cycle. So at trial B, um, she was on day 25 of her cycle. Um, another example I've taken from uh, Carolyn Sunderland and colleagues, they did a heat acclimation intervention in female footballers. So what they did for their trial A, they still placed it 28 days before trial B, but they did their intervention in the last 10 days of those 28 days. So they went about their normal activity for the first couple of weeks. Um, and then they just slid their intervention over and did that um, just before doing the post intervention trials. So that's another way to do it, to make sure that you're testing people in the same phase. These constrictions are going to be based on whether you just have a moderately active person or a non-active person, or if they kind of have the constraints of um, high level individual sports or team sports, where uh, they might be kind of tied to a certain training program or tied to practicing at a certain time. Um, so when things like that come in, you have to think about this hierarchy of control. So if you are meant to have someone on day three of their cycle every time, but on the Wednesday that they're supposed to come in, they have lectures all day and there's no way you're getting them in for 9 a.m. It's worth having a little bit of wiggle room um, because you're probably better off testing that person on day three and day four um, at the same time of day versus day three and day three, but 9 a.m. and 8 p.m. Um, so thinking about, okay, what's actually feasible? what's more important and, and before actually starting your study thinking okay if this happens what am i going to do how wide is my window what am i willing to accept and having those thoughts beforehand um will help things to run a little bit more smoothly and keep you from being too discouraged or frazzled when things do need to be flexible so now you've designed your study and you actually want to implement it and uh, know about the logistics during uh, your lab sessions so one thing that people sometimes um, are nervous about or are worried about is just starting that conversation, initiating the conversation about menstrual cycle or about oral contraceptives um, and how to do that. And they just feel really, really awkward and don't even know how to ask. Um, one way to start this off is you're gonna need to know some information from them. So giving them a questionnaire. You can um, give it with their, their PARQ or their general health questionnaire where um, the next page is just a few, few questions about their menstrual cycle. From there, you can look at the questionnaire, make sure that um, everything's answered properly, and ask them, um, okay, I see you have a 28-day cycle, that's great. We're gonna bring you in for your repeat session about a month from now, awesome. Or, oh, I see that you, um, you say you have really severe symptoms. When we, reschedule, when we schedule your next visit, maybe we'll, we'll do it uh, a couple days later, or something like that. 
that's a good way to start the conversation. Another way is just asking someone, do you mind if I ask you some questions about your menstrual cycle? That way they have the choice um, whether to say yes or no, whether to partake in the conversation, um, and they kind of know what's coming and they've you know, kind of given their consent to, to talk about it. When you're giving them a questionnaire, um, one thing to look out for is the clarity of this. So we talked about how um, there isn't really as much um, formal education or general um, correct knowledge about the menstrual cycle even in female athletes or female uh, general population. So when you're asking someone, what is the length of a typical cycle? Uh, we've found, and so other studies, other studies have found that sometimes um, women will give the, the answer that it's three days or five days or seven days. And that's not really what you're asking. So making it clear that we mean how long between the onset of one menstruation to, or the onset of menses one month to the onset of menses the next month. Um, how long is that window? Or how long is that cycle? Um, so just making sure you're really clear in those questions. Um, a great way to uh, know more about your, your uh, participant who might not know themselves, might not know on the day when you give them the questionnaire, is to have them track their cycle. Now this is useful for cohort studies um, because you then get to know the length, the regularity, and any subjective feelings that could stop someone from coming in or symptoms that could stop them coming in. Um, but you can get even more information um, about their subjective feelings and symptoms and how that affects their training if you're doing a case study. Uh, Garmin and Fitbit and Nike kind of have those uh, options within their apps already where you can log those symptoms um, and log when uh, menstruation starts and how long it lasts. Um, but if they don't have kind of an activity watch or an activity tracker already, um, Clue is a really good app. And that's because uh, not only does it log all of those things, but it also allows um, the user to share their cycle with someone. So you can get those real time updates um, about your athlete or about your participant. Um, and that goes without them having to come in, having to message you or anything like that. So that's all right in the app, which is um, really useful. Um, so overall, these logistical considerations, they're, I want to make it clear that they're not barriers, um, but they're things to keep in mind just so that your study runs smoothly and so that having um, female participants doesn't turn into a barrier. Um, a few of the other logistics to think about are your actual um, exercise setting and the privacy of your lab space. Um, so this most of these stand true for both male and female participants, um, but especially in the research that we do, where we stick people in a really hot room, and a lot of times uh, women will want to uh, work out in really short shorts and a sports bra, which is cool. They're a lot more comfortable that way, um, but that might be worth thinking, okay, how many people do I actually have to have in here? How many people are going to be coming in and out? Can I stop people from coming in and out? Can I make this a more private space? And again, this is something you should be thinking about regardless, but might be a little bit extra, um, worth the extra thought if you uh, are including women in your studies. Um, thinking about the duration of your protocol. So uh, a lot of times studies will like to have uh, women come in in the first couple days of their cycle. Um, as we know, some women ex experience really severe symptoms um, during that time. So how long can you have someone in a room without access to a bathroom in the first few days of their cycle? How long does your protocol really need to be? And if it needs to be long, maybe it's worth pushing um, your, your window to the, to the middle of the follicular um, phase or a couple days after the onset of menstruation. Um, and it's also just worth reminding them, especially if it's the first couple times in, their in the lab, they're not really comfortable or not really knowledgeable about the space, reminding people, okay, before we start, um, the bathroom's here if you want to use it. Easy. Um, and then someone feels, feels fresh, ready to go, and they don't have to worry during your, part during your protocol. Um, thinking about the equipment you use. So again, doing thermoregulation re uh, research, we want to know people's body temperatures and we want to know their skin temperature. We use a foresight system and one of the sites is the chest. So we place a skin thermistor just under the clavicle um, on, on the upper chest of a participant. And that usually means reaching around their sports bra. 
So some people feel really uncomfortable all of a sudden realizing that they're gonna have to touch someone's sports bra strap. Um, and what someone will, might do is just look away, not say a word, do exactly what they need to do with shaking hands and try and forget about it. What will make people a lot more comfortable is just asking. So talking them through, letting them know that, okay, this is gonna go on your, your upper chest. Do you mind if I move your sports bra strap a little bit out of the way to be able to take this down? That's the same for things like heart rate monitors that go around the chest. Um, people aren't always too savvy with the, with the hooks or with the clasps and just letting them know, okay, is it all right if I touch your back? Is it okay if I do this? And again, that's something that you want to do with any participant consent that you can touch them, that you can administer some equipment. Um, it's gonna be important for anyone, but especially if you're touching around the sports bra area, just um, really making sure you're, you're talking through it and it's gonna make everyone a lot more comfortable. That being said, when you order said equipment, um, how big are you expecting your participant to be? So we've worked with a lot of 18 year old endurance athletes. Um, some of the women are very tiny. A medium heart rate monitor strap does not fit them. A medium face mask or harness does not fit them. So if you do plan to have um, female participants and especially endurance athletes, how, how big um, is, is the equipment you're ordering? Um, how, check the measurements, talk to someone who's smaller, have them try something on. Um, it'll save you from having to kind of MacGyver your own equipment uh, to try and get it to fit someone. Trust me. Um, so these are some common challenges. While uh, we, we want to include more female participants, um, some people do say, you know, there, there are things that are challenging. And there are things that are challenging with any participants. But particularly, um, one of these challenges is the education and the misinformation that really surrounds the menstrual cycle. So I've thrown some stats at you about surveys and how people respond and stuff. So, so we know that there is a lot of misinformation. There is a lot of um, trouble with, with knowing what terms mean what. Um, and like I said at the beginning of the presentation, you're not, you're not the only one. So if you can find that out, if you can serve as that pillar of knowledge, um, I'm sure your athlete or your participant will be very appreciative. Um, I showed that really nice figure near the beginning again about the interwoman and the intercycle variability um, for different hormones. And I just showed estrogen, but that's true for uh, any of the, or for both ovarian hormones and both anterior pituitary hormones um, that affect ovulation. So trying to nail down those windows and expecting someone to come in uh, on day one and it's gonna be Tuesday and it's gonna be this day and all of a sudden they have menstruated, started menstruating two days early. Um, it happens. There is a lot of intercycle and interwoman variability in their cycle. Um, that being said, uh, that means that it's probably worth speaking to the people that you're sharing your lab with. So if your window is tight, um, and you need someone to come in a certain time or after an intervention, it's, uh, it's worth having the conversation with the person uh, you're trying to schedule with or scheduling around before it happens uh, so that they know kind of the, the situation that you're working with. And uh, there's no disagreements between lab members. Um, your recruitment pool, if you are including women, fantastic. Your recruitment pool essentially doubles, right? Right? Um, that depends. It depends if you want to include just normally menstruating women and um, then actually finding normally menstruating women. Um, going back to that variability between people. Um, or if you're including people using oral contraceptive pills or any kind of hormonal contraceptive and what brand they're using and all those things we talked about that, that can make a difference and surround uh, the different responses we see. Lastly, um, we talked about verifying the phase uh, that, that a woman is in when she comes in for a visit. And the best way to do that is with a blood sample, but a lot of times we don't process those until we've collected all of our blood samples. Um, so how can we know what phase someone's in without knowing uh, what their blood levels of certain hormones are? Um, one way to do this is using a uh, home ovulation kit. Uh, but these can be frustrating because they're not uh, quantitative. They are a yes, no, or kind of result. Um, and again, it depends on that person's uh, levels 
of luteinizing hormones. So these home ovulation kits will use uh, a, a test strip. You will uh, dip it in a sample of urine, and uh, that's that's done first thing in the morning, and it will measure the amount of luteinizing hormone uh, in in the urine. And that's kind of to say, okay, someone is ovulating, their luteinizing hormone is up, great. Um, so we know now we're in the phase of ovulation. If that's when you want to test, perfect, go for it. From there, you can say, okay, I want to catch the mid luteal phase as well. How do I do that? Okay, five, six days from, um, from ovulation is when we're going to test. And you can set your windows that way. Um, the last thing I want to touch on here is looking out for your participants. So if you're doing a study where you're uh, measuring someone's blood pressure and you notice that they are really hypertensive and they might not know, um, it's kind of your duty of care to tell them uh, and, and to let them know and have that sensitive conversation with them. Uh, same thing, there are a few extra things to look out for when uh, you're including female participants and especially female athletes. So looking out for signs of REDS, which is relative energy deficiency in sport. Uh, and this is an expansion on the female athlete triad, which uh, many people have heard of. One big sign of this is amenorrhea. Amenorrhea is the absence of a menstrual cycle for at least six months. Um, this term was only correctly identified by 18% of athletes who were studied um, by Brianna Larson and her colleagues. Uh, this I think they, they surveyed them a couple years ago, but this study came out this year. That is not very many people, especially considering the prevalence of amenorrhea in athletes. Um, so if someone does mention that they don't have a regular cycle or they don't normally menstruate, um, that might be a little bit of a red flag that uh, they are experiencing relative energy deficiency. Um, another fl uh, red flag would be when you use these home ovulation kits, um, noticing that someone month after month, maybe you're missing their window, but maybe they're just not ovulating. Um, maybe they're not getting that rise in luteinizing hormone, which means that they're not getting a rise in estrogen, which is really important for bone health. Um, and that's something that they might not have caught because they still get their, um, they still menstruate, but they're not ovulating. So what does that mean? And, and that might be a reason to think about, okay, how much, um, how many calories are you actually taking and how much training are you doing? Is it matching up? Um, when you ask them about their oral contraceptive pills, um, some women will say, oh yeah, I started it to, to regulate my uh, cycle because I wasn't, I wasn't menstruating, I wasn't getting a period. Okay, well, they're just masking the, uh, the amenorrhea. That withdrawal bleed that they're getting isn't the same as uh, normal menstruation. Oh. And it's worth uh, letting them know that this isn't a uh, this isn't a healthy way to regulate uh, your your cycle. What was your cycle like before starting on oral contraceptive pills? Um, might be questions worth talking to your athlete about, especially if you're a practitioner, especially if you're doing a case study. Um, a lot of oral contraceptive pills will also have side effects, and this varies depending on the type of progestin used. Um, some people don't know that there are different oral contraceptive pills that they could take. They don't know that there are other options for hormonal contraceptives, hormone contraceptives. So if your athlete is taking a hormonal contraceptive or using a hormonal contraceptive and they're having really serious side effects and they think there really is an alternative, um, pointing them in the direction of uh, government websites or of their doctor um, might be a good idea so they can talk about different ways to manage those symptoms. And lastly, uh, again, in doing thermoregulatory research, something we're interested in is uh, plasma volume and fluid regulation. Uh, one way to look at this is measuring people's, or involves measuring people's hemoglobin concentrations. Um, women are, do experience um, iron deficiency anemia at a greater rate, and uh, their, their hemoglobin levels might be low to begin with if they're in, endurance athlete um, just because of the hemodilation that comes with endurance exercise. Uh, but if it's below two, uh, sorry, 12 grams per uh, deciliter, that's when you, you're you saying that, okay, this is something that might be affecting you. It might be uh, affecting your energy levels and might be something that you can get um, the, the proper care for and the proper interventions for.
So these are all things to look out for when you have uh, women and specifically female athletes in your lab. Okay, so to summarize everything we've been through, hopefully um, you've taken something useful from this. Um, that there is that paucity, there is that gap of research that includes or is focused on women, focused on females. Um, this is really important because there are physiological effects of sex, of menstrual cycle, and of hormonal contraceptives. And each woman will usually give you a slightly different response as um, people have really different experiences with the hormonal contraceptive they use or uh, with their training and with their individual uh, experiences with their menstrual cycle. But with some logistical planning and some consideration, including female participants is really achievable and it really improves research quality. Um, so hopefully you've taken from this that, okay, what we can do is uh, compare by sex or compare by menstrual cycle or um, investigate questions using hormonal contraceptives, but also, you could just include women in your studies, um, and these are kind of all the tips and all the ways that you can do that. And that way, as we move forward with research, um, we're not continuing to uh, continuing to widen that gap. We're closing it. We're with future research. Um, we're taking female athlete research with the rest of it. So thank you so, so much for listening to me. Um, if you're still here, <laughs> uh, you can contact me through email or for, through Twitter if uh, you're interested in hearing more or if you just want to say hi and get in touch. So thank you, um, Russ, I'll open it up to any questions. Nice one. Thanks very much for that. That was uh, fantastic. A lot to, yeah, a lot to take in, a lot to think about. And I think we, um, as a male researcher, I guess we've got a lot to be better at really or a lot to to consider going forwards um i don't have any questions that was really thorough so i'll just open it up to the rest of the group if people want to to chip in yep go on Teresa. sorry i was trying to figure out how to turn off the mute all right <laughs> One thing that I'm particularly interested, also amazing presentation, absolutely loved it and I've learned so much coming from a female athlete as well. <laughs> when you're talking about how women, um, you know, often don't actually know that much themselves, it's so true. Um, anyway, one thing I've been really interested in is you, you talk about how women have their absence of period and how that affects their training. And one thing I started looking into is, um, and I've been thinking a lot about recently is how women respond in terms of stress, maybe from training and other life factors as well. And sometimes it can cause a lengthy period as well. And I was wondering, do you know anything? Cause there's no research I can find that kind of talks about that. Um, and having experienced that myself, um, where it just continued for a really long period of time, it had a lot of ongoing effects. Is there anything that you've thought in terms of considerations as to what, what that could cause later on in terms of physiological adaptation and their health? Um, yeah, definitely. So this is uh, something that we kind of subjectively hear a lot about um, or people experience themselves and uh, talk amongst themselves that, oh yeah, I, I get that as well. Um, and that's kind of where we've gotten all our information on because as you said, I don't really know of any studies that have particularly linked um, the menstrual cycle, daily, daily stress, and long-term effects. Um, that would be that would be awesome. Um, I'd love to see that. But yeah, I don't know of any, any data on it either. Um, if you were going to do a uh, either long-term, like long longitudinal study on this, um, or a case study, um, like I said, some of those apps do have quite a range in like, not only the symptoms that you can like click button, 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 um, but also usually a note section. So like um, potentially encouraging uh, your athlete just like once a week to sit down and go like, okay, how stressful has my week been? Um, you know, how do, how do I, how do I feel? How am I sleeping? Um, and all of those things and being able to paint that kind of clearer picture of what's going on. Because like you said, I don't know of any um, like big cohort studies that, that show that. And it's been more on an individual basis. 
Sorry, I feel like I didn't give no, any exploration no, there. No. I just I agree. Something out, yeah, just exactly <laughs> what I'm feeling. There's nothing out there. And it's like, well, how do you provide recommendations to other people or just give us some more information? And there's literally nothing out there. So I was just wondering if you knew, and that's okay. It makes me feel a bit better about my research abilities. Yeah, right. Um, but yeah, if anyone does find something, please uh, do send it my way. It's very interesting. Always interested to hear about um, the menstrual cycle and, and sex differences. Right, have we got any more? Any more questions? Or do you want to leave it there and you can get in touch with Natalie if um, there are any, any further questions? I'll take that stunned silence as a as a yes. We'll we'll wrap up there. Um, yeah, thanks very much for doing that. That was fantastic. And um, I know people who maybe couldn't join the call were really keen. And yeah, great to have um, Greg and Glynis on the call. Um, and that, that yeah, I guess that sort of shows the importance of this to our centre and and sort of where we're headed and what we want to try and achieve. So that's fantastic. Um, Cheers, Nor, for your thanks as well. So, Natalie, that was great. Um, but yeah, we'll, right, I'll better stop recording.